Hello and welcome to the Toasted Tale podcast. My name is Jim, and today I want to look into what has often been forgotten. Those people and events from our past that we may have lost records of. Or there may be aspects of people's lives that have been lost to history. When I first started wanting to make this podcast, the inspiration that I had was to find and explore the stories of some women of history who, in their time, may have had a great impact, but we know little about them today. Now, I found a list of some very interesting women who undoubtedly affected the time and places that they were. They may have held large amounts of power, they may have been wealthy, they may have shifted society. And while I was doing this research, it made me look within myself, because I had this feeling that was brewing at the back of my skull. It was something that I wasn't expecting to feel, but I guess is so obvious. History... Now, I love history. I'm not a trained historian, but I am a student of historical facts and what happened before. And there is so much that we don't know. We've got a general idea of the empires and the people, the important events that happened, but in between, all of the little details have often been lost. Now we can visualise and and almost populate the past uh, through television shows and movies and our own simple desire to understand the world that we live in. There are millions and millions of people who have lived before us, and in some ways they are very different. The time and place and the countries they were born in will have undoubtedly different ideals of what it means to be men and women, what it means to live successfully, and what you need to do to achieve honour and prestige. There are also characteristics on the other side of this coin, which are very similar. You read in ancient texts people caring about their family, and wanting to bring security and safety to those around them. We haven't ever really lost our desire for wealth and power either. Honestly, the history books are more timelines of important powerful people living interesting lives and through their actions affecting millions of people. Even with all this information though that we have through historians, modern and ancient, there are still massive gaps that we've had to fill with our own imagination and assumptions. On to these badass ladies though, the one I chose was a lady named Livia. Now, over 2,000 years ago, Rome was a major power around the Mediterranean, and was ruled by the Senate in Rome, which had positions where individuals from rich and powerful houses, those who had the influence and gravitas, who could be voted in to positions of power. It is here where they would work various offices in the capital that dealt with everything from ruling the empire and its many different conquered territories, all the way down to much more mundane matters like sewage collection in the Greek quarter of Rome and things like that. Now, two of the major Uh, political entities in Rome at this time were two families, the Claudians and the Julians. Throughout Rome's history, these two families had vied for control, and at one point maybe the Julians had been more powerful than the other, the Claudians, and it had been a bit of a race throughout history. And of course there were other big, powerful families as well, but these two were very prominent. Now, Livia was born from Marcus Livius Drusus Claudianus. So she was from the House Claudius. 
And, as with many such arrangements, marriage was a political tool to bind houses together and consolidate power. So, Livia, as a Roman woman, accepted the role that was assigned her gender by being wedded to maybe strategically political individuals that can help the family prosper. Her first wedding was to a man named Tiberius Claudius Nero. Now, they had two sons, one named Tiberius and the other named Drusus. At this point, she may have just slipped into the annals of history as just another mother of two men who would eventually grow up to enjoy their own successes. But no, in 38 BC she divorced Tiberius Claudius Nero and married a new man, an up-and-coming power within Rome, the political leader Octavian. Now for those of you who do not know Octavian, he was a massive deal. He was an understudy to the now famous Julius Caesar, who started the process of revolutionising the Roman system. Before it was a republic, ruled by the Senate, which was a vast amount of very rich and noble men, who controlled the running and administration of the empire. And Rome wasn't foreign to war, it was actually what they built their lives around, really, and what got them the empire in the first place. But when a succession of civil wars broke out, one of which, which involved the First Triumvirate, which was made of three individuals, powerful individuals at the time, Julius Gaius Caesar, Nerus Pompeius Magnus, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. This was where the free men attempted and vied for control. They were all very powerful and wealthy, and they hoped to use this influence and the armies that came with it to take control of the most wealthy and powerful empire of the day. Now, Crassus fell by the wayside quite early when he tried to take on the Parthians to the east, but Pompey and Caesar kept battling it out, eventually with Julius Caesar being victorious. Now, his success did not make him Emperor of Rome, but it did start the shift of powers going to one man, which was himself. The precedent, you could say, was set and a path had been laid forward for someone to take, if they wished, to seize more and more control of Rome just for themselves. Following Caesar's assassination, a second triumvirate was created of Mark Antony, a former general of Caesar, Octavian, and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. This political alliance, uh, which set out in order to consolidate power, in turn eventually turned into a civil war, which, once again, one slipped out of the running quite early on, Lepidus, and left Mark Antony and Octavian to beef it out. Octavian was the victor and took the spoils for himself, and further assuming supreme control of the city and empire. Now let's go back a little bit to Livia. Now Livia married Octavian in 39 BC, importantly survived the uh, brutal civil wars which took so many people's lives, and very quickly became an important political advisor and confidant of the new soon-to-be Emperor of Rome. In turn, she of course became the first empress of Rome, and with this came a unique amount of power and influence. Now, in these ancient of times, women had a tiny amount of power in comparison to their male counterparts. Most would never even be put into a position where influence could be achieved. 
Livia did exactly what she could, though, and she relied heavily on her high intellect and ability to scheme effectively in order for her to achieve her own goals. She had two sons from her first marriage, uh, Augustus or Octavian from his previous marriage, had a daughter, Julia the Elder. And so, with no male heir to Augustus, there was the potential to have a succession crisis. Now, he adopted many people and tried to foster a similar relationship that he had to Julius Caesar with many up-and-coming and promising men. This was so as to have the right individual for when he needed to pass on the reins to the right person. For Livia, this presented a tricky situation. She herself had two sons, and she was in a position to influence whether her direct bloodline would one day become more powerful or maybe drift into obscurity. Suggestion and rumour are abound by ancient historians that Livia used her influence and soft power to pave the way for her son Tiberius to become the next emperor of Rome following the death of her husband Augustus, and they would infer that this was through darker and violent means, such as assassination, defamation, and removing people from the picture. And surely, Tiberius was made the next emperor of Rome. The ancient historian Tacitus did suggest that, in his later years, the aging Augustus was heavily under the influence of Livia. And this is shown by the way that Livia in Tacitus' mind, was able to persuade her husband to exile his only remaining grandson, which then paved the way for her choice being Tiberius. Tacitus writes in his Annals, Book 1, quote, Towards Livia, too, exorbitant was the flattering court of the Senate. Some were for decreeing her the general title of mother others the more particular one of mother of her country. And almost all moved that to name of Tiberius should be added, end quote. To me, it's quite clear that Livia had her detractors at the time, and some of the ancient writings we have, which we base a lot of our knowledge of ancient Rome on, were people who had very mixed views about ladies like Livia. She did what many women of the time could not, living to the grand age of 88, outliving her husband, having great influence and advice to give the important people around her on the running of Rome, and also manoeuvring her direct descendants into positions where her lineage could continue to grow and prosper. The main thought I have while doing this research is how much more information there certainly was on this individual, and how a lot of it has been lost to history. It would be fascinating to learn more about Livia Drusilla, and understand the true extent of her impact, but Such is the mysteries of history, where the true understanding we could have of our ancient ancestors lays dormant behind the veil of time. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to today's Toasted Tale podcast. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit and learn a bit more about the very interesting life of Livia, what she was able to achieve, and the circumstances around the life she led. If you liked today's episode, then you can follow me at Podcast Tale 
on Twitter and Facebook. It's there where I post new episodes, and also where I post anything that I find interesting. That's at Podcast Tale for more. When I'm bored, I also try to live stream Podbean shows. I haven't got a specific time when I like to log in and just ramble on, but I'm going to be trying to do that more often, so keep an eye out, and if you see it going live, come and join me and say hi. I really look forward to speaking to you all again soon, and I wish you all the best with everything you attempt. I will speak to you all again soon for another toasted tale by the fireside.